You ain't heard nothing yet. On the night of October 23rd, 1950, the lights here on Broadway in New York were turned off and the traffic was halted. It was show business's salute to a singer who'd risen to the top in every field of entertainment, Al Jolson. For almost two decades, his name alone was enough to fill the vast Winter Garden Theatre here behind me on Broadway. In 1927, he went to Hollywood and made the first talk in the jazz singer, and his popularity reached out to movie audiences. Twenty years later, the Jolson story ensured that, even towards the end of his life, his name and his fame were legendary. This is the centenary year of his birth, and we look at the man behind the phrase that he was the greatest entertainer the world had ever seen. Mammy! Mammy! The sunshine east, the sunshine west. I know where, I know where the sunshine best is on my mammy I'm talking about. Nobody else is. My little mammy. My heart's arranged, I tangled around. Alabama. Mammy. Mammy, I'm I'm coming. Oh, I hope I didn't make you wait. Mammy. Mammy, I'm, I'm coming. Oh, God. I hope I'm not late. Mammy, don't you know me? It's your little baby. I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles. My name. The man who made his name in blackface was in fact a Jew, born Asa Jolson in Lithuania. In 1890, his father, a cantor, emigrated to the United States and his young family followed four years later to settle in Washington. The family were to be united only briefly. By the time Asa was ten, his mother had died, leaving him, his two sisters and elder brother in the sole care of their stern father. But the rebellious Asa was stage-struck and had no plans to stay in the ghetto. I think Al's story was very much like that of any other kid from the wrong side of the tracks who decides that the only way he's going to make good is by running away from home. He did that, he sold papers, he tried to be a mascot in the Spanish-American War at the end of the last century. He appeared in the chorus of Children of the Ghetto. But it was really, I think, in a greasy spoon restaurant called McGurk's or something like that, which is the way he put it, that he'd be made his mark. He, he made his first public appearance. He went up to the guy who ran the place and said, uh, would you give me a cup of coffee if I sing a song to you? And the fellow said yes, and the song was called Rosie, You Are My Posy, which became one of Jolson's big hits. Rosie, you are my posy. You are my heart's bouquet. Asa was on his way. He changed his name to Al Jolson, and when he was still only 12, accompanied a risque burlesque act in a touring vaudeville show called The European Sensation. He then partnered the tenor, Fred E. Moore, and when he was 14, teamed up with his equally ambitious brother, Harry, in an act they called The Hebrew and the Cadet. In 1951,
In 1903, the two boys were joined by the veteran performer, Joe Palmer. They toured with only moderate success, until Al put on blackface for the first time. A fellow singer suggested it would go well with the southern accent he picked up as a boy in Washington. But when he was 19, the restless Jolson left to go solo, and in 1906, he arrived in California, where his blackface singing act was very well received. It was in 1906, too, that something else much more important happened, much more significant. In the rubble of the earthquake at San Francisco, he stood in a makeshift theater on an old platform, threw out his arms and said, You ain't hurt nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. For the next 40 years, he'd never begin a show without it. Wait a minute. You ain't hurt nothing yet. The next year, still in San Francisco, he met and married his first wife. He also signed up with Lou Dockstatter's famous minstrel troupe. The touring minstrel show had dominated popular entertainment for more than 50 years. And though the tradition was now on the decline, Dockstatter's troupe still enjoyed great success. Yes, sir, it rains every year that we play here. But no matter how hard it rains, we give the same beautiful performance. The minstrel tradition did more than simply entertain. It created the myth of the naive and laughable Negro to reassure white Americans that their black countrymen were both harmless and inferior. The ambitious young Jolson was soon promoted to principal solo artist. Uh, a hard-working young man who loved uh, stage. What made him what he was? I think that it was the world he lived in. A hard world, lots of competition. There were a lot of other people out there singing, but none of them had the spirit and the feel and the verve that Al Jolson had. He inserted an advertisement in Variety, the showbiz Bible, as it's familiarly called, and he wrote and said, Watch me, I'm a wow. Even then, when he was in his early 20s, he knew that if he wasn't going to sell himself, nobody was going to do it for him. Just along, just along. In 1911, Lou Dockstadter and his troupe were taken over by the Schubert brothers, Broadway producers who are about to open their lavish new Winter Garden Theatre. Jolson won a small solo part in their opening show entitled La Belle Paris. Glory, hallelujah, I just phoned a parcel. Hey, Pa, get ready to call. Once on Broadway, Jolson went from strength to strength. For the next 15 years, he was to star in a string of Broadway hits, always in blackface and playing similar characters. Just rolling along, just rolling along. By 1916, he was billed as America's greatest entertainer. He was 30 years old, and he had a contract with the Schubert brothers that earned him $2,000 a week, plus a $10,000 bonus. During the next five years, his Broadway shows featured songs that were to be like personal theme tunes for him. I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles, my mammy. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. Rock-a-bye, your rock-a-bye baby with a Dixie melody. Oh, he opened his mouth and... and uh... 
it was bells. I mean, I, I love the way he sang. I don't think I would today. I think it was a corny way of singing, but I, I really loved every time he opened his mouth in those years. At that instant, he hypnotized a thousand people at one time. When he said, I'm coming, hope and I'm going to be late, I'm coming. Yeah, mammy, mammy, I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles, my man. He thrilled people. rock a your baby with a Dixie melody. Whoever had, there was never such an extrovert in the scene. It was extroversion. Most people are introverts. When he sang about Dixie, he probably had never seen the South or thought of it. But when he spoke, sang around Mammy and Dixie, you believed suddenly that he came from the South and he had this, uh, this Southern mother. Uh, it, it's that kind of thing, and lots of energy. In almost every show he did, Jolson introduced new songs into his act at will. Not only did this please the audience, it pleased the songwriters too. Jolson was more than a star, he was also a hit maker. This man did a song on a Sunday night at the Winter Garden. The following week, every singer in show business was imitating and doing the same songs that he did. And he had an instantaneous hit. In 1918, two young songwriters called Irving Caesar and George Gershwin wrote a song they called Swanee. Despite being lavishly performed in a well-known theater, it flopped. One night, Jolson playing in the Winter Garden was giving a party at a place called Bessie Bloodgoods. Don't ask me to describe Bessie Bloodgoods, but use your imagination. It was the highest priced joint, and it was $25 a trick, and the most beautiful girls in town were, work, 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 working there in that business. So George went to the party, and at the party, Buddy said, George has a wonderful song with a guy called Caesar. You ought to hear it. So, George said, let me hear it. And George played Swanee, and Buddy sang it for us. I wasn't there. I wish I'd been there. And Jolson turned to his musical director, Al Goodman at the time, and he says, I'll break that in Thursday night. He broke it in Thursday night, and within 10 days, there were orders from all over the country. That was the magic of Jolson. Swanee, you're calling me, you're calling Swanee. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you, my I give the world to be among the folk. In a sea I exile, even though my man is waiting for me, praying for me down a mile of Swanee. The folks up north will see me no more when I go to that Swanee town. His name is on a few. He never wrote anything. He wasn't creative songs. He never wrote anything. He wasn't creative. He was creative singing he, 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 in, ter in interpretation. But Jolson decided that his interpretation was actually a major part of the writing of a song and made sure the song sheet said so. The composers couldn't object. They needed his ability to sell their songs. Here was the situation. If Jolson sang a song, you had a hit. If, he, if you had to start from scratch, you had to really scratch. I mean, you had to really try to, to, to struggle to, to get the hit. Here was an instant hit with him. Like other entertainers, he'd go round and see the competition at work, and he'd go to the burlesque houses and the vaudeville theatres, and he'd take a notepad with him and a pencil, and he'd write down the gags that he'd hear. Some of them he liked very much. So much so that he'd use them in the, his show in the very next performance, and then get his lawyer to send a a rather cryptic note to the original comedian saying, I heard you use Mr. Jolson's material last night, don't, or else. Other performers stole lines too, but only Jolson was ruthless enough to threaten to sue his victim. He billed himself as the world's greatest entertainer, and he was, but also the world's greatest ego, and malcontent, and all the rest of it. Uh, there's a tendency when he performed to forgive everything else, and you can unless you have to deal with them every day. Well, he was a cruel man. He was a cruel man to the people that worked for him. Uh, he had no patience with him. His tolerance spanned probably 15 seconds or some kind like that. 
I could see them shrivel. You know, you're bound to shrivel when you're hurting. And yet uh, they stayed around. People didn't leave him. I mean, he had a few people around him all the time. I'm sure he really didn't mean it. I'm sure it was a matter of a moment, but you must remember that because it's true. It's absolutely true. He could decapitate you, but it was that same temper that occurred in his song, that same flare-up, that same vibration. It was the a dynamism when Jolson walked into a restaurant. If you had your back to the door, you knew that somebody had walked the vibration. Jolson had a vibration. He had incredible energy. Uh, I don't ever remember him really being quiet a great deal, except when he was lying in the sun, baking. And he was black, black, black all the time from the sun, and he may have gotten his energy from that. Boy, isn't he a honey. The world's greatest entertainer. Yes, sir. And from what I hear, in more ways than one. There were times when Mr. Schubert used to have to get one of the girls, one of the lovely showgirls, he knew them all, I mean, and so did Al, to go in and have an affair with Jolson before the curtain went up. So that it would reduce his energy, reduce his vitality. Jolson was friendly with the opera singers, Enrico Caruso, and particularly... To Jolson, having a woman was very much like having the lead in a show. It had to be his show. He had to have his women who were his cast. By 1926, Jolson had been divorced, had remarried a showgirl called Ethel Delmar, and was divorced again. Although he was known as a great womanizer, both wives stated in their divorce actions that the other woman Jolson loved wasn't a mistress or lover, it was the whole audience. Fido Shaliapin. Each admired the other's ability to perform, on stage and off. So one day, Jolson told me this. Shaliapin said to him, Oh, I have a beautiful apartment. I have got there caviar, champagne, vodka, all the kinds, the best of everything. You get six, eight nice girls, and we make them with them all afternoon. We make, and we make, and we make. Get nice, get six girls, and we make with them all afternoon. I wouldn't have wanted to be anybody in his life, I would tell you that. Uh, whether it could be a wife or a, or a child or, 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 or whomever, because they would take second place. Or third, or not any place at all. I mean, you would become part of his audience. That was the man. He was... He loved the, the, the applause. He lived for applause. When he did a Broadway show, he sent the, the last part of the show home and he, he stayed on the rest of the show himself. Take this curtain up. Has he lost his mind? Only Jolson had the cheek and the inspiration to dismiss the rest of the cast partway through a show and then perform solo until he got tired. What the cast thought of this isn't recorded, but the audience couldn't get enough, and that was all that mattered to Jolson. This may go on for a long time, because I think I got another dozen songs in me and I'm raring to go. He was a compulsive singer, who only seemed fulfilled in front of an audience. He loved it best of all if his rivals were watching. He would do a benefit or a charity performance on Sunday so that all his peers could see him perform because they couldn't see him during the rest of the week because they were performing themselves. And he'd rub it into them. He would uh, single out people, talk to them, right from the stage, or sit on the edge of the stage and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with some 
star in the first or second row. And it was a, uh, he was the, the king. Scholz's love of competition and innovation was a mark of his career. It was as important to him to be first as it was to be best. Later on, he was to make the first pilot TV appearance. He was the first to entertain the American troops in three wars, and he cut the first long playing record to be released in Britain. And he was also the first to take a full top class Broadway cast on tour. But even on tour, he brought that ruthless streak with him, as his Broadway rival, George Jessel, remembered. After the first show, there was a commotion backstage in Al Jolson's dressing room, and he ran back to see what was going on. It turns out that Jolson was berating the theater manager because the acrobatic act, which was on first, an hour before Jolson was stopping the show, and on Jolson's shows, nobody stops the show but Jolson. That's the way it was, and the acrobatic act had to be fired. Jessel also used to, a phrase he used all the time, he says, Jolson was jealous if somebody opened a successful laundry. It had, show business was just incidental. Uh, why he was like that, I have no idea. I suppose, if you dig deep underneath it, maybe there's a certain sense of insecurity, which sounds impossible. If Jolson came down to breakfast, he made an entrance. When he went to the bathroom, he made an exit. When he came out, he went into applause. Sure, he was, Jolson was full of show business. Jolson was also full of patriotism. He loved his adopted country with an immigrant's fervor and energetically campaigned in the presidential elections for the Republican candidates Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding. His campaign song, thankfully never recorded, may well have been the corniest he ever sang. of New York's many-sided life, the march has come. A solid phalanx behind Roosevelt's recovery program. Later, he marched in a vast rally in support of President Roosevelt's National Relief Agency, set up to counter the effects of the Depression. The biggest thrill I ever had in my life. I thought I was thrilled the night I was married. But this has got it on it. Awesome. I was only married to one woman. There are millions here. And they're all for the NRA and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Jolson suffered in the Depression too, losing $4 million in the Wall Street crash. But he still had enough left to offer vast handouts to his colleagues who had lost everything, a gesture simultaneously generous and crushing. This was the man whose chat up line to Barbara Stanwyck was, I've got $30 million in the bank, want to help me spend it? He was always promising people things, but uh, meeting it at the moment. If you could get him at that moment, You'd become rich, you'd have a home, you'd have an automobile. But it was only at that moment, you see, you would have to get him at that moment. And he used to say to all of us, I've got you in my will, I've written you into my will. Now why he did that, I don't know, because all of us, every one of us said, that isn't important. None of us want anything except just to be with you. So one day, we were in his car. He said, Cookie, you know I love you. I said, I, I think you'll love me, Al, when you say it. Really, I do. But I want to tell you something, Al, and I'm proud of this, and this, it describes Jolson. And he says, your love is about as serviceable as the light of a lightning bug or firefly. He would understand that. If one was going to read the Bible by it, you mean what you say when you say it, but that's how long it lasts, and that's the truth about Jolson. You had to get him at the moment. And that's how he sang his songs. California, here I found, right back where I started from, where flowers, a flower bloom in the spring. Each morning, at dawning, birdies sing, and everything, a sun kiss, miss, and show me. Then in 1927, the king of Broadway left for Hollywood to make what was to become the first ever talking picture. California, here I come. Hey, 
why I can hardly wait. Open up that golden gate, California, here I Jolson arrived in California in 1927 to begin his film career. Shortly afterwards, at the same railway station, he met the showgirl who was to become his third wife, Ruby Keeler. He was 42 when they married in 1928. She was 19. Ruby probably knew what she was letting herself in for on her wedding night. Just as she was laying out her silk negligee on the bed, Al looked at her and said, you know what, honey, I think I'll go for a walk. She said, all right. He went for a walk, past the local fire station, where he just happened to walk in, say to the men, would you like me to sing to you? They said yes, and for four hours he sang there while Ruby paced the floor at home. Jolson had come to Hollywood to make a film called The Jazz Singer for Warner Brothers. The title part had originally been offered to George Jessel, who'd starred in a Broadway version, but he demanded too high a fee. Darrell Zanuck reputedly retorted, a hundred thousand dollars? For that money, we could get Jolson. And so Jolson, cannily accepting stock in lieu of fees, began work on what turned out to be the first talking picture. Warner's was the first studio to get the Vitaphone, uh, which was a trade name for Western Electric, sound on disc. And you remember the disc was a great big object about this tremendous thing and it was uh, synchronized with a flexible cable and it wasn't easy to do and they were never sure that the lips would be in sync with the sound and there were many reasons it would jump off or a, a car would go by the stage and the needle would jump one groove that's all it needed so uh, they were taking a risk they didn't think it would work Al wanted to do uh, some dialogue and but nobody knew when or where so they were ready for it and all of a sudden, he turned and he said, You want to hear Toot 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 All right, hold on, hold on. So listen, play Toot 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 three chorus, you understand? And the third chorus, I whistle. Now give it to him hard and heavy. Go right ahead. And the, uh, the director and the rest of the people on the stage weren't sure it would even come off. But it did. It came off beautifully. Warners was so encouraged that that same evening, they wrote the first ever scripted scene combining synchronized talking and singing. It was filmed the next day. I never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw things going so right. Noticing the day, hurry and by. When you're in love, oh, don't it fly. Blue days, day, day, all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from now on. You like that, Mama? Yeah. I'm glad of it. I'd rather please you than anybody I know of. Up until then, they were a studio that was fortunate to stay alive from month to month. They didn't have a lot of theaters then. They had almost none. In fact, let me be frank, they had none. The theater ownership came much later. Uh, they were lucky if they could finish a uh, few pictures. The jazz, jazz singer made a great difference because had it failed, they'd have been busted. I believe that uh, my mother had to hawk her jewelry to help out on that, and the other uh, wives of the brothers. But the jazz singer was a huge success, and Jolson followed it with The Singing Fool, which went on to do even better at the box office, grossing more than any film until Gone with the Wind. It featured a sentimental song called Sonny Boy. De Silver Brown and Henderson were the top pop writers of their, of their time. They'd written songs like The Best Things in Life Are Free, and Jolson rang them up in no doubt, hoping they'd do a song for him for free, too. And he told them the story of, of the singing fool and how he had this little boy, Sonny Boy, and he said, look, I got this kid, and his name's Sonny Boy, and I want a song. And they realized that this was so maudlin, uh, they didn't really want to have their names to it, but they, they wrote it in a hotel room in, in Atlantic City, and they laughed and they gagged about the whole thing, they thought it was ridiculous. In fact, they were so ashamed of what they'd written that they'd got the bellboy at the hotel to post it for. When he was ill in hospital during the war, Jolson met a young nurse called Earl Galbraith. Although she was nearly 40 years his junior, they married in 1945. If the marriage was unexpected, what happened next was unprecedented in the history of entertainment. There was Friars' benefit here. Friars is a, is a, show, a show business club that does charity work. And there was a large benefit on which every actor can imagine appeared. In fact, Ronald Reagan was in the chorus. Clark Gable was in the chorus. Bob Hope and Jack Benny and Danny Kaye and the Kate Thompson, the Williams Brothers, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, 
all the more there. And Jolson promised me he would come. And he did. On provision that he'd be the last act on. All these acts stopped the show when they did encores. And I was backstage with Jolson. This is the time, by the way, when he was pacing and perspiring and, of course, cursing everybody, every encore. He hated every performer that was on before him. Well, to make a long story short, he found, they knew well enough that not, not to put him on earlier than last because nobody could follow him. They put him on finally. He finally got on at about 1 o'clock in the morning. And he stopped at a quarter of 3, and that audience would have sat there till 9 o'clock in the morning. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You made me want to. And all the time you knew it. And Jolson was to find that some of them still loved him. The idea of making a film about his life was suggested, but only Harry Cohen, head of Columbia, and an old fan of Jolson, thought it might work. The only problem was, who was to play the part of the young Jolson? Typically, the 60-year-old could think of only one suitable candidate. He could not see anybody else as Al Jolson except himself. Uh, but he, there was no way he could have done it. First of all, he wasn't that young at the time. It wouldn't have worked if he had done it, you know. Everybody knew that but Jolson. See, he was in a strange position. If the picture was a hit, I mean, Jolson, from his standpoint, if the picture was a hit, how could he get all the credit if somebody else is playing him? That was, he was making a star. He wasn't interested in that. He was interested in Al Jolson. At the same time, if it was bad, it would reflect on him. So he was like, they say, between a rock and a hard place. Mammy. The star he created was Larry Parks, up until then a B-movie actor. The face on the screen was Parks, but the voice that sang the classic songs was Al Jolson's. He recorded them, and Parks mimed them. My mammy I'm talking about, nobody else is. My little mammy, my heart strings are tangled around. Well, a mammy. All the songs, that is, except one. In the film, the number Swanee is done by Jolston himself. And nobody ever could tell that. As far as, as far as the audience is concerned, they think it's still Larry Parks. It's not, it's Jolson. Jolson insisted he had to be in the picture someplace. came to see Jolson perform. It's just quite an incredible sight. Everybody was just thrilled because they hadn't heard him for a long time, you know, and uh, it was thrilling to hear him. I, on the other hand, was used to his voice. But I knew there was something wrong. So uh, when it was over, I, I wasn't cheering. And he came up to me and said, what's the matter with you? I said, well, you left something out. And well, there are things wrong in the second chorus. At which point he took out an, a huge roll of $100 bills and he shook it in my face, and he said, I made this a show business, show me yours. The old Jolson was back all right, his voice and temper as powerful as ever. The Jolson story was released in 1946 and became an instant hit. Jolson was thrilled, famous again, and happy at home as well. Things got better still when in 1949 a sequel to the Jolson story appeared, stating in its title what everyone knew by then, Jolson Sings Again. One, two, three, four. David Payne. Jolson was 62 and by now only had one lung. But he recorded the songs again and again filmed demonstrations of how they should be performed for Larry Parks to copy. You should have started, oh, baby face. I'm up in heaven when I'm in your fine embrace. I didn't need a shove, because I just fell in love with your pretty baby face. Baby face, you got cute as little, oh, you got a baby face. There's not another one could take your place, oh, baby face. 
My four heart is jumping. You should start a summer of baby face. I'm up in heaven when I'm in your fun embrace. I didn't need a shove, cause I just fell in love with your pretty, oh, you baby face. He never mentioned Larry. He just didn't acknowledge his existence. I expect somehow the picture finally in Jolson's mind became him. And what he looked like even. I suspect that. One embrace, you're like a breath of spray when shoulders say about your baby face. Suddenly, Al Jolson was bigger than he'd ever been before. A new generation of people had discovered this this old entertainer called Al Jolson. Top of the pops, he was making records again, selling them bigger and better than he'd ever done before. He'd re-recorded most of his old hits and quite a few new ones. He was persuaded, quite reluctantly after a time, to have his own radio show. He seemed to be enjoying being guests on other people's shows. The annual ratings had worked out that in 1948, he was the top star of the day, top singer, top male singer of the day. Second was Bing Crosby, third was Perry Como, and fourth was a, a young upstart by the name of Frank Sinatra. When he sang this live, hear people breathe on the screen nothing like that because you didn't feel him his whole uh, his whole approach was trying to get inside of people and on the screen he didn't know where to look all he was trying to do is not look at the camera but there's no doubt he suffered terribly on the on the screen, and the live stage was really his bread and butter. Though April showers may come your way, they bring the flowers that bloom in May. And if it's raining, have no regrets, because it is raining, rain you know, it's raining violet. His face wasn't seen on the screen now, but he was in his real element, giving radio and concert appearances to live audiences. You soon will see crowds of daffodils. So keep on looking for a bluebird and listening for its song whenever April showers come along. In 1950, America went to war again. Jolson was now a 64-year-old with a severe and painful bronchial condition. But he was so determined to play his part that he paid his own passage to Korea. So keep on looking for a bluebird and listening for its song whenever April shower, come along. Four days after that concert, on October 23, 1950, back in San Francisco, Al Jolson died. Goodbye. George Jessel read the funeral eulogy. And not only has the entertainment world lost its king, but we cannot cry, the king is dead, long live the king. Because, my friends, there is no one to hold his scepter. I can't think of a luxury more attractive than having Jolson with you for a while. I said for a while. Because he ate you alive, his energy ate you alive. I've been away from you a long time. I 
never thought I'd miss you so. Somehow I feel your love was real. Near you. I long to be. The birds are singing, it is song time. The band of strumming soft and low. I know that you yearn for me too. Ronnie, you're calling me. Ronnie, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Ronnie. I give a word to me among the four. Oh, my man, he's waiting for me, praying for me, down at Ireland, on me. The folks up north will see me no more when I go to that one in Tom. 